Father, you are good. Uh, that is known and felt and relied upon. Father, when we face the dark circumstances of life, we need to know that you're there, and you are. We need to know that you are all-powerful, and you are. That you are in control. You most definitely are. And Father, the, the peace that comes with that, the trust and the belief that your word is faithful and your word is good and that you are working to, uh, to bless and to bring together, not to separate apart. Father, I know that there are many who want to divide, who want to, who want to uh, separate, who want to judge, who want to condemn. But Lord, I just thank you that you're a God of love. You're a God of blessing. And you're a God who can. So Lord, thank you for this time that we've already experienced tonight of singing of your unchanging hand. Lord, uh, to pray to you to know that we have your undivided attention. And Lord, as we look to your word, it's your word for us. So speak to us personally. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At the end of the service, um, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for me. Sunday, we are going to um, be um, speaking, really, the whole service is going to be speaking on the Word of God. And uh, Brother Broadus is going to give us um, a word from uh, uh, the Gideon ministry. On I asked him to do that for us, and he uh, humbly accepted. So he's going to be doing that for us as well. He'll be showing a video. Uh, and then speaking, and then there will be another video. But um, I thought we would just take the whole service and just talk about the Word of God. Because uh, we have the Word of God. We are grateful for the Word of God. We believe in the Word of God. Uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. All those things we know and believe. And when you talk about the Word of God, the um, chapter Psalms 119, don't turn to it tonight. If you're turning for tonight, turn to Luke 4. But Psalms 119 the, is the longest chapter in God's Word, but it all deals with the Word of God. So what I did was I got some uh, scriptures out of the Word of God, and I won't, uh, I want to, it's going to take 22 of us to make it happen, but different people are going to be saying two or three, reading two or three verses that I'm going to give you the, the, those particular verses, and we're going to read those from Psalms 119. We're going to sing songs about the Word of God. We're actually going to read the Word of God. Uh, we're going to talk about the ministry of the Word of God. And then we're going to talk about uh, the, how the Word of God will come uh, flowing through us. Uh, God gives us that Word, but He doesn't want it to stop there. He wants it to flow through us. So uh, at the end of this tonight, I've got some sheets of paper for all those who um, would be so honored to read God's Word. We'll have the mic for you, and I'm going to ask you to do that. And we'll tell you how, how and when and all that. But if you would, take those tonight. All right? Take one of those tonight. And um, that'll be a good thing. All right? Say amen. amen. All right. That, that, whether you agree with me or not, you're going to agree with me. I like that. Um, in Luke 4, Jesus began, began his ministry. And he went into a synagogue and... Uh, as was his custom, uh, he would go into the synagogue and he would stand and he would read the Word of God. But on this particular occasion, he found uh, the Scripture that spoke of uh, verse 18, The Spirit of the, Lord, of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He was saying this was the ministry that God had given him. And this was his spiritual uh, ministry. That meant that the power of God would empower this ministry through him. He had laid the glories of heaven he had left heaven, emptied himself of those things, clothed himself in humanity, and he came to serve 
you and I. And on this particular day, he announced his ministry. And all those people who knew him, all those people who had watched him grown up, all those people who had seen him out in the streets, all those people who had seen him ministering to children, ministering to people there, loving on people, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus always acted in love. He was probably one of the most respected, most well thought of. They probably thought he was the most kind, the most generous. He had never said a wrong thing to anyone. He had never given a wrong look to anyone. He had never misled anyone. He had always fulfilled everything that he said he would do because that's the way the Son of God would act. Amen? And this is what they knew. This is what they had seen. But now he steps up. They were very, very accustomed to him doing this. Probably from the time that he was 12 years old on, he would be in the people, he would be in the house of God, though he would be humble, but yet he would always have a good word to say about his Father in heaven. Not lifting himself up, but now for the first time he is saying, now this is the ministry God has given me, but this is a ministry really that God has given to you. And, and he, was, he was setting up the work that he would do in describing this. Now, the people did not receive it well. I'm not going to talk much about that, but I've always asked myself the simple question, why? Why could they not see this perfect one who was the perfect example, who is coming forward not to bring notoriety to himself, but simply to say that this is the ministry of God, that God's going to open the eyes of the blind. God's going to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Why would people not have been excited about that? But yet, it did not fit their understanding or their desires, or really their wants, and they rejected it, and he would leave that. Then, he um, went down in verse 31 to Capernaum. Not the greatest religious city, trade city. And there he would do um, most of his ministry. There most of his miracles would occur. But it says that, well, let's begin reading in verse number 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. So once again... Like it said before, um, when um, in, in verse number 17, he, he, or verse number 16, as was his custom. So he went to the synagogue, he's reading the word, and look at what it says in verse 32. And they were astonished at his teaching. That, the best way I can use to, to describe that was it was a jaw-dropping experience. It was so unique so different they it, it was a wow moment it was just it was so di it, it caught them their attention and they're like wow can you believe this that they sensed and felt and knew the glory of God because that's who he is he is God now he had come to surrender himself to the ministry of God and now as he is beginning this ministry, everyone could see Christ in him. Everyone could see, well, they, Christ, he was the Christ. He was the anointed one. Everyone could see God in him. That he just came to minister to, to them. And I think about this, and I thought, you know, Christ was humble. Jesus was humble. Jesus was surrendered to the, to, to the will of God. Whatever that will would be. And I got thinking about that. You know, everything in nature is surrendered to the will of God. Every flower that blooms, blooms by the will of God. Every drop of rain that will happen in the next two days will happen because the sovereign God allows it. Every leaf that blows in the trees because the wind blows upon it blows because God is in control and in command. Every facet of nature surrenders to God. 
And we've grown accustomed to that, haven't we? I got in my vehicle this morning and drove to work expecting that vehicle to surrender to my commands. When I pushed the gas, I expected it to go, and it did. When I pushed the brakes, I expected it to stop, and it did. When I turned the steering wheel one way, when I turned the steering wheel the other way, when I turned on a blinker, when I turned on the radio, whatever it may, may be, it was built for me to be in control, to me to be in command, right? We understand that. We expect that. This building, that ceiling, and we're very comfortable with that. We, that ceiling was built for us to be able to use it we are under control and command of this building. We turn on the lights, we turn off the lights. You, you believe that that seat will hold you because it is surrendered to the one who made it. It has a purpose and it's fulfilling it. You starting to see where I'm going with this? All the things of God should be surrendered to God. And we see them all the time, and we understand surrender, but we never voice it. Because we need, to, we need to understand the one that is in control of all those things. So here, look in verse 32. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority, with power. Now, in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, he was demon-possessed. This person was invaded by a satanic being. And a satanic beating, being has harm as his interest, has power and authority. And he's bringing that satanic, unclean authority over to control this man. That is not the will of God. That's never been the will of God. Every one of us were built to be surrendered and controlled by the power of God. Any time that that does not happen, we are out of the will of God. That's not the way God planned it. True? Listen to Jesus' reaction. Um, he goes on, he said, he, in, in the end of verse 33, he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? This is the unclean spirit. We don't want you, Jesus, to be, uh, you, leave us alone. Let us do what we want. Isn't that what sinful man always thinks? Come on. I mean, we, we want to be doing what we want. We don't want anybody else to tell us what to do. We don't want anybody else to be in control. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Surely they know who he was. They were created perfect. They were one of the creatures of God who their sin, their sin caused them to be cast away from the presence of God. They were once surrendered under his authority. But when they took authority back over their own life, they were cast out. They were now under sin's control, satanic control, selfish control. So they're saying to him, are you going to come in and command us? We want you to leave us alone. Look in verse 35. Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. Now, why did he first say be quiet? Answer it and I'll speak it over the microphone. Why did he tell him to be quiet? What day was it? The Sabbath day. And there, there were things that they saw that you could do and you could not do on the Sabbath day. Now, he was, what, did he, what was the second thing he said? He said, be quiet and what? Come out of him. Now, later on in Jesus' ministry, he would walk in to the synagogue on a Sabbath day and there was a man with a withered hand, right? And he, they were watching because they said, is he going to heal him on the Sabbath day. The, 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 they had taken the, the, the 
relationship that God had with them, and they had put so many rules in it. And one of the rules was you were not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. And they had, meant, they had taken it that you could not do anything on the Sabbath day. It, it, healing, would, they would consider healing sin because they would consider it work, and you're not supposed to do any work. So he says, number one, be quiet. And number two, you don't need to be in that man's life. You are not in control of that man's life. Get out of him. He was doing the work of Christ. He was doing the work of setting the captives free. That's what he told us earlier in this chapter. Amen? He is coming to set at liberty those who are uh, captive. That's what he says to this man. He say, he's speaking to the authority over this man and says, you, we don't want to hear anything you have to say. You be quiet. And by the way, you have no authority over this man. You need to get out. Verse 35, and when the demon had thrown him in their midst, he came out of him and did not hurt him. It, it threw a fit. Can, can we just say it that way? He, and they had a fit. Didn't like it, didn't want to like it, and they, so they just threw this man down to the ground. And I might have to go out, but I'm going to go out huffing and puffing. Right? So he... This man falls down and then all of a sudden this man feels bitter than he's felt in a long time because that once thing that was controlling him is now no longer controlling him. Once that was leading him in darkness is gone. Now he is in the presence of the one who is there to give light. The, can you feel the burden? Come on now, listen. Let's put ourselves where he's at. Can you feel the burden leaving? Can you see the control now being set free that now this man can choose for himself who he will serve? And then in verse 36, then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is. A powerful word from one in authority. For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they came out. He has a word of God. And when you have the word of God, you have the authority of God. That's the one thing I wish we could get back in church is for people to know and understand that when they hear the word of God, they, it is being offered. And anytime anybody takes the word of God, they have the anointing and the power of God with it. You cannot separate the word of God from the power that stands behind the word of God. They come together. Whether you claim it or whether you don't claim it, that's on you. But just understand, where the word is, the liberty, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom, there is power in the Word of God. It is not the power of us that makes it happen. It's the power of the Word. That's why Jesus said, what did he say about himself? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. Genesis 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was was God. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. The power of God is there with them. I love this. He said, what a word this is. What a word this is. Verse 37, and the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. When the word is there, the word will be shared. I'm going to just let that sit. When we see the word, when we accept the word, when we are freed by the word, when we accept the authority and the power of the word, we will speak of that word. We will share that word. That is the controlling work of God in us. Amen? That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to declare what we think, but we are supposed to declare, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, the power is in the word. Now, it gets fun here. Look in verse 38. Now, he arose from the synagogue, entered Simon's house. So they're going to Peter's mother-in-law's house. And Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him, that is Jesus, concerning her. So there's a woman that is sick. She is dear to them. She, she has got a, not just a fever, high fever. Jesus didn't say, take two Tylenol. 
No, no. They said, come, can you help? Right? They made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her, rebuked the fever. Are you good with the fact that Jesus is better than any situation? Any need? Jesus has power over any need. I'm pausing because I, I think we need to amen this. We need to understand this, that whatever the need, whatever the need, Carla, whatever the need, Miss Margaret, whatever the need, Jesus has power over that need. May we never, may we never come to the place where we see circumstances separate from God. May we always look at circumstances, but know that there is a God who is there who is able at the same time. So, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Look, when Christ heals, Christ heals. He doesn't send it out to committee. He doesn't say, let's get a word back and then we'll decide. When the power of God is there, it overcomes the circumstance and the situation then. There are times that we pray and there's a delayed reaction. There's times that we pr pray and we don't get the immediate response. We don't see the immediate response, but that doesn't mean the response is not already there. So here we see they've left synagogue. They've come there. There's a need. Now, in synagogue, he had power and authority. Out of the synagogue, in a personal situation, he had power and authority. And people see that. They sense that. They know that. They spread that. Look at verse number 40. When the sun was setting. Why is that important? Why is it important that the time is that the sun is setting? Well, the, when does the day begin? It's the end of the Sabbath, and the new day, day begins at sunset. That's the way they saw it. So healing was not supposed to happen on the Sabbath, the way they viewed it. So when the sun was setting, verse 40, all those who, uh, who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on, look at this, New King James says, every one of them and healed them one at a time one at a time I saw a guy on TV and he was supposed to be healing and he was standing up there and their crowd was there and the people in the crowd raised their hand and he went like this he went <sighs> and it was like dominoes he just knocked over all those people I want you to know God works one heart at a time God works one person at a time so when we pray, we pray specifically. We pray for our nation, amen? But we pray for our president, right? We pray specifically for specific needs. We have a list where we pray for specific people. We don't just say, Lord, bless those in the hospital. We pray specifically for those in the hospital. We don't just say, Lord, bless the lost. We, we pray that, but we also pray specifically for the lost that we know, right? He heals one heart at a time. Lives matter. One life at a time. So when it came time that, that now it's the opportunity. They brought anybody. They brought everybody. I don't know all the, it doesn't tell us all the needs that were there. It just says sick. And he healed. No circumstance. Greater than him. What if there was a leper? Well, then a leper would get a touch from Jesus. Amen? What if there were others that were controlled by demons? Well, that person would get a touch by him. And today, what we look for, what we pray for, what we want, and what we need is for individuals to get an individual touch from him. I want God to save the soul, then God to save the life. Save the soul, 
and then set them free to learn to walk in newness of life. Open them up from sin and then let the light of God's glory to shine in. Let them be converted. Let them become, become one with him. Then they can be set free to walk the difficult, hard circumstances of life. And the Spirit will create Christ in them. They will react to the circumstances in a Christ-like way. They will become followers of Christ. They will become disciples of Christ. They will become worshipers of Christ. They will become servants of Christ. They will become givers to Christ. They will become uh, access so that others could come to know Christ through them. He saves their soul and then he sets them in ministry as they face their circumstance, I'm still going to be a sinner. You're still going to be a sinner. I'm going to face the circumstance, but God's doing a cumulative work of teaching me and discipling me and encouraging me and forgiving me and strengthening me and sending me. We're never going to get to the place of the pinnacle that we've made it. We don't have to do anything else. It's going to be a constant walk is what Paul called it. Demons came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. He rebuked them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Get this, and I close. Verse 42, when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place. You would think after such a massive day and night that he would stay and multiply, Right? But the work of God led him to a deserted place. The crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. What they wanted was, Lord, don't leave us. Sounds like when he was about to ascend back to glory, doesn't it? Hey, hey, whoa, we just got it right. It just got good. Don't leave us. Oh, no, no, I, I must go away, right? I must go away. Look what he says here. I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. I must preach the kingdom of God to other people also. Because for this purpose, I have been sent. I think this is the ministry of the church. I must preach. We must tell of the goodness of the kingdom of God to other people also because this is our purpose. This is why God saved us. This is what, and God's going to put us here facing circumstances so the outside world can see those circumstances. They can see what God does in us. They can be attracted and want the same thing to be done in them. This is our ministry. It's the ministry of the word. We must not allow ourselves only to be ministered to. We must minister. The word does not stay within us. It's given to us so that it may pass through. I love the fact of this, that this began with Jesus surrendering himself. And everything that we saw that happened that was powerful and astonishing and amazing after that happened because of surrendering to the will of God, to the word of God. And that's where we must begin as well. Amen. I'm going to pray. And then as many of you who will, who will take part of this, I want you to come forward and take one of these. All right? Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We pray blessings upon all those who hear the word of God tonight. Father, we all stand in need of a touch from you. And I am grateful that you are patient and long-suffering and kind. I am grateful that you have placed us upon this path and encouraged us to live for you. I am grateful that you've called us into holiness. Lord, not that we can claim holiness, but Lord, we can just follow your holiness and let you do a ministry of life in us so that we can share that ministry of life with others. 
Thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven us, not just seven times, but seven times 70. To the uttermost, you have forgiven us. Thank you, Lord, that that same resurrection power that is working in you is the same resurrection power that works in the giftedness that you gave us. You have called us to ministry. You have called us to love. And Lord, it's not in our goodness, but it's in your goodness we stand. So Father, thank you for what you have done and what you are doing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.